All right, well, we're going to be looking at God's Word, and as I mentioned, there's five of us that are going to be sharing, and let me just say that I am so thankful for what God has done in this last year in putting this team together. Um, I, I say often that everyone who's involved in any way in our church, I am so appreciative for our elders, our deacons and deaconesses, everyone who's involved in ministry, every different area of ministry. But in this last year, God has brought together the five of us to do what primarily just me and my wife had been doing for a long time. Um, and we were so glad that God brought Pastor Henry and Emma to us to work with our young people. And their responsibilities will be expanding this year. So thankful that God brought Nathaniel home because of coronavirus and talked to him about staying here instead of going back where he was going to school so that he could help us with the area of worship. And I'm not saying those areas are more important than others. I'm just saying that it has really lifted a, a great load from my wife and I in particular. And so as we were planning tonight, we decided this is what we're going to do. So the five of us are going to share. And our instructions, the instructions I gave to them is just, I want you to plan to speak for about five or six minutes. Okay, and I know what that means. All of you are going to start looking at your watches, setting timers. Um, but anyway, five or six minutes, and just pray. We talked about this about a month ago. Just pray about what God would have you share with our people on New Year's Eve. And that's basically all the instructions that there were. Now, I don't remember if Pastor Henry volunteered or if he was drafted. <laughs> but he gets to go first. The advantage is he can say whatever he wants, and he's not repeating anything somebody said in front of him. But he also has to go first. And so he's going to come and share with us. And as soon as he's done, then Emma will come. And as soon as she's done, Nathaniel will come. And then my wife will come. And then I'll come back to share what God's laid on my heart. Pastor Henry, we love and appreciate you guys. Looking forward to what God has to say through you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, don't worry about checking your uh, timers because there's no way I'm going over five minutes tonight. <laughs> I like to keep things short and sweet. Amen? <laughs> All right. Um, well, for many of us, 2020 was supposed to be a year of what? Focus, clear vision, clarity, right? 2020 eyesight. But instead, it was a year of distortion, pain, harsh reality. Our year, right? Everyone was saying, oh, this is going to be our year quickly turned into, okay, when is, when is next year coming? The year of vision turned into blinding realities. And as the year closes out, not a whole lot has changed. Many of us are still disappointed. Many of us are, are still grieving, confused, maybe angry. I, I know I've uh, found myself asking God questions such as, God, why did it have to be the year that my brother was in Japan? Why did it have to be the year that my sister was leaving for the Navy? Why did it have to be the year that we get married? And as I was reflecting on the year that has passed and anticipating the year to come, I came across five simple words Paul spoke to the Corinthians uh, that I believe that God was kind of laying on my heart and, and something that he was wanting me to take heart in this coming year. He says this in 2 Corinthians 6.10, As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. I know that makes no sense out of context, um, so I, I want to emphasize what Paul is doing here. He's defending himself against the claims of his opponents. So this is just one statement out of seven statements over the short span of two verses. Um, and each statement, Paul gives kind of uh, at the beginning the argument uh, of the people and then counters each argument with what God says of him. So Paul is not saying that he didn't have any pain. He's not saying that he had no sorrow. He's not claiming to never have grieved. What he is saying is that those things, those sorrows, those emotions never defined him. People may have claimed that he was a sorrowful man, yet God would say that he always rejoiced. Paul always rejoiced. Rejoicing marked his life and his ministry and all of his letters. This is what God would say about Paul. Can God say this of us? A lot of us are walking away from 2020 wounded, and, and we are looking to the new year as if it will solve all of our problems. 
Yes, I know there's a vaccine, but the virus doesn't just magically disappear out of nowhere. What does this year actually look like? What does God have in store for you and I? And the fact of the matter is, no one knows. And so as I was reflecting, I was also preparing. And in my preparation, I wanted to challenge myself and in turn, challenge you guys as, as we journey into the unknown together. What would it look like this year if we were to always rejoice? What would it look like in our families, our marriages, our personal lives, this church, this community, if we were to be people who chose to rejoice? If we have learned anything from this year, we have learned that life is unpredictable. Situations will arise, pain will inevitably strike, sorrow will come, but will we be a people who choose to rejoice? Will I be a person, a believer, a follower of Christ who chooses to always rejoice? Will that be my testimony this year? So as the new year begins to unfold, can we choose to rejoice? Before anything happens, can we have the faith to choose to rejoice? Can we trust God enough to rejoice in Him and His purposes for the year to come? Coming out of 2021, I know that's a long way away, could God say, Henry always rejoiced? Joe always rejoiced? Chris always rejoiced? Emma always rejoiced? Could God say this of you and I this year? Thank you. All right, so by a show of hands, who this year hoped for something and it didn't turn out the way you quite wanted it to? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought, me too. Hope is something we've done a lot here in the year 2020. Um, we've been hoping this virus would disappear. We've been hoping it wouldn't affect our plans. Oh, sorry, am I not on? Or what? Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> um, so hoping everything would turn out all right politically, economically, domestically. Um, and before diving into my mini message, I just want to give you a glimpse of what my 2020 looked like. Um, this time last year, I was sitting down in my living room with my mom with a cute little planner that had 2020 engraved in gold on it. And uh, we were writing down dates for bridal showers. We were writing down dates for vacations to Colorado, to Japan with Henry's family. We were writing down uh, everything for the year 2020 and dreaming about our wedding month. So needless to say, 2019 Emma was extremely hopeful for the year 2020. Um, but come mid-March, we were canceling bridal showers, trying to reimagine them as drive-by showers. Uh, any plans that involved flying anywhere came crashing down, including our original honeymoon plans. But we still tried to hold on to the hope that our wedding would still turn out the way we had originally hoped and planned for the last year. So we all know how that went. Uh, summer actually got worse, not better. Um, and our wedding actually turned out to be a mere shadow of what we had planned for. So family members weren't there. There was no reception, no cake, no dancing, just a vow between two kids and a very sweaty photo session afterwards. <laughs> um, so. Looking back at all of that, I realized I was numb. At that point, I was just trying to survive past the wedding day. I didn't feel the weight of obliterated hope until three to four months into marriage. And I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm getting emotional about that, but I was bitter. And maybe I still am bitter, but I think I've begun the healing process now. Hope can often be a misconstrued word. I read one definition that says, hope is an optimistic state of mind that is based on an expectation of positive outcomes. I would say not always to that one. Another definition reads, a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. Sort of, but they're missing the point. Biblical hope is not optimism based on the likelihood of an event happening. It is a choice to wait and exercise faith in God. The whole Bible is a story of hope. 
In fact, our Christian faith is based on the hope that Jesus will soon return. Hope without faith is meaningless. It's a blind leap. I want to read from Hebrews 11.1 1, and break that down for us. It says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And that's from the New American Standard Version. If you haven't memorized in KJV, you most likely remember something different. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If faith is the substance of what we hope for and evidence of things not seen, then that should tell us faith is not just a mental state of mind, it is discovering evidence of what we hoped for. I think for most of us, the issue is not our lack of faith, it's our misplaced hope. I would say the majority of people in this room believes that God exists. Uh, believing in Jesus doesn't mean throwing reason out the door, but we have very good reason to believe that this man was the savior of the world because hundreds of people have testified of his death and resurrection. So it's not our lack of faith, it's our misplaced hope. We do not doubt that God can, we doubt that God will. Our hope is not in Jesus, it's in a job or a relationship or an event. Since hindsight is always 2020, I realized at the end of this year, my hope was not in Jesus at all. It was in an event, it was in a wedding, it was in bridal showers. And I totally lost sight of my one true hope. So, my question for you is, do you have misplaced hope? Do you feel hopeless because of this year's circumstances? If you answer yes to either of those, um, I would challenge you to re-examine where your hope lies. Um, the reason why misplaced hope is so dangerous is because it can leave us feeling depressed, anxious, hopeless, and extremely doubtful, which in turn hurts our faith. If our hope is not in Jesus, then our faith in Jesus becomes illogical. Why? Because if faith is the evidence of our hope, and if our hope is not in Jesus, then we are just taking a shot in the dark, hoping that everything turns out okay. We, we don't have security. We don't, we don't have hope in anything because it's just hope. Hope without faith in Jesus is nothing. You will most likely end up feeling dissatisfied, depressed, or paralyzed by the weight of your crushed hope that was rooted in absolutely nothing at all. So, as I'm wrapping up, my challenge to you is not, do not get comfortable in your hopelessness. Instead, re-examine the evidence of what you hoped for. If it does not lead back to Jesus, redirect your hope back to him. When our hope is in Jesus, we are less likely to be let down and more likely to see the bigger picture. So that's all I have. Test, test, okay. I'm going to use my mic tonight. Um, and uh, the title of my short sermon for tonight is I Leave You With Peace. And I don't know if you've been noticing the topic, the themes, the names of uh, Pastor Henry and Emma's uh, short sermons, but I'm noticing that they each have one word that it's, it's based on. Now, we didn't, the only thing we, we planned about this was that, you know, we were just supposed to pray about God, what God wants us to talk about. But we didn't talk to each other about what we were going to talk about. So, with that in mind, we're going to continue with uh, what we have. So tonight, uh, the, t the title for my sermon is, I Leave You With Peace. Peace is something everyone wants, yet few seem to find. What is peace? Can it be defined as tranquility, harmony, or security? Depending on the situation, it could mean prosperity or well-being. Various forms of the word peace are found 429 times in the King James Version of the Bible. There are different types of peace, including false peace, inner peace, peace with God, and peace with man. We're going to be talking about the peace of God for the short time that I have. And I have th three points. It says four, but it's three points. 
um, for tonight. And my first one is be the peacemaker here on earth. Be the peacemaker here on earth. In, in John chapter 14, verses 27, it says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift from the world, gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or be afraid. And, and so what I get from that is, and what I want you guys to understand from my, the, my message tonight is the peace, the peace of God. The peace of God was with Job when, when Satan tried to come against him with the different things to test him. The peace of God was with Sarah, with the being barren with her child. The peace of God was with Moses as he led the people out of Egypt. The peace of God was with Jeremiah. And the peace of God was with Jonah. And the peace of God was with especially Peter. And so what I want you guys to understand from this is if God can do it for them, then God can do it for you. And my second point goes right into that. And it says, pray that God will guard your heart with peace. And I, I put together that verse with Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7, and it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace with exceeds and anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I want to declare that peace will just begin to flow in each and every one of your lives. In every situation that you face, that the peace of God will guard your heart. It will guide your mind in every situation that you face. The peace of God, that when you face a situation, that you not, you not only just begin to praise and exalt him in that, because God said he wants you to praise and pray in all things, but that you would have that peace of God that transcends everything. The peace of man may be like, okay, I, I guess I'll just go with it. But the peace of God, there's something about the peace of God that just, it makes you so relaxed, so calm, that it's just unexplainable. So I want to leave you with this last point that it says, Pray that the Prince of Peace will be your portion today and forever. I'll say that again. Pray that the Prince of Peace will be your portion today and forever. And so, Heavenly Father, I just want to pray right now. And I pray that my problems that look so big... And the storms in my life are so furious that in that very moment, I will call on your name today and forever. To calm the storms in my life and to let your peace fill my life. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name and we all say amen. Amen. You got to love how the Holy Spirit brings things together. Because I have one word, and it's faith. So we've got joy, hope, peace, and faith. My mini sermon comes from John chapter 6, verses 16 to 21. And it says, when evening came, his disciples went to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had moved about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, coming near the boat, and they were frightened. 
But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. So tonight we're going to talk just a moment about faith. What is faith? You've got to have faith because the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. Faith is a mindset that expects God to act. Faith is a mindset that expects God to act. When we choose to act on this expectation, we will overcome our fears. Amen? That's easy to say, but when an unexpected storm arises, it's not always so easy to live by. Like Emma and, and her wedding, she had all these great plans, and she trusts God and believed God, but, but when everything kind of started getting topsy-turvy, it was hard for her to have that kind of faith. Is it going to come together? But it came together, just not what she had hoped for, but it still came together. We need to understand when we expect God to move, we have faith in God. We need to know God is going to move on our behalf what is best for us. He's not just going to give us what we want. We can't have faith that, God, I have faith that in 2021, you're going to give me a brand new Cadillac. I mean, if he wanted to do that, he could, but I would prefer uh, uh, something different than that. But we've got to have faith that God is going to provide what is best for us, what we need, what is going to work out for our own good. So how can we keep this faith-filled mindset? We keep the faith-filled mindset by remembering what God has done in the past. We remember how God blessed us, how he provided for us, how he healed us, how he raised us up, how he set us free. When we remember those things, it reminds us if he did it then, won't he do it now? God is faithful. In this new year, my passion, my desire, my trust in God is that I will face every situation with faith. The kind of faith that I expect God to move on my behalf. Expect God to do what is best for me. No matter what comes, no matter what winds and waves, what storms arise in 2021, my challenge to me, my challenge to you is to expect God to move on your behalf for your good. God bless you. All right, the pressure's on. None of them went over. <laughs> but I just said they could each take five or six minutes, and they only took five, so I can take each of their extra minutes. I'm, not, I'm just joking. Well, I guess I'm out of sync because I don't have a one-word title, focus. But I want to jump right in because I do want to try to stick to what we've uh, planned for here. There's an old saying with a response, and you maybe have heard it. If someone says, God is good all the time, right? And then somebody says, all the time, God is good. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight is God is good. And to be honest with you, all the things that have been talked about so far up to this point fit along with that. Because God is good, we can have joy and we should rejoice. And our hope is in God and in his goodness that requires faith. And if we can have the faith to believe that and act on that and live that, then we will have peace. But I want to talk to you tonight about God is good. And I want to read to you from Nahum. And the focus is just one verse, but I want to read the context. So I'm going to read to you Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. And if you try to find it, you better have your index handy because it's a real short three-chapter minor prophet in the middle of a whole bunch of books. But I'm going to read this passage from the beginning of Nahum, eight verses, and I want you to look for God's goodness, okay? It starts out by saying this, an oracle concerning Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum of Elkoth. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. 
The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him and the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. What an encouragement, encouraging message. God's goodness. Is this the best text to show that God is good? I mean, a couple phrases, one verse maybe, but the rest of it seems so focused on God's anger and his judgment. How can this be the source of God's goodness? And we have to understand the context. God called the prophet Nahum to give this prophecy, and it's only three short chapters, and it's God's judgment on Nineveh. Now, Nineveh may bring about some memories, right? There was another prophet that God sent to Nineveh to talk to them, right? And that was Jonah. That was about 100 years before Nahum, and Jonah didn't even want to go. God told Jonah to go and warn the Ninevites that God's judgment was going to fall, and and Jonah wanted God's judgment to fall. But he knew if he brought the message, they might repent, and God wouldn't send his judgment, and that's exactly what happened, and Jonah got really upset. Why was Jonah so upset? Nineveh um, was at various times in history the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire was one of the most evil, wicked, um, cruel empires in the history of the world. Full of injustice and slavery and bondage and putting down and taking over and conquering everybody else. And if you study it, terrible things they did to the people they conquered. And they were just north of God's people. And God's people, while Assyria was in power, was always under threat of attack and invasion. And that's why Jonah wanted God's judgment to fall. But Jonah went and he preached and they repented. But now it's a hundred years later. And Assyria has become even worse than they were before. And that's why God has these very harsh words for them. Because they were a constant threat to God's people. They were a constant threat to God's plan. They were a constant threat to everything that was good and righteous and and holy. And God says, I'm only going to put up with it so long and then judgment's coming. And that's exactly what Nahum was saying. But but what God was telling his people in these harsh words, he says, listen, I am in control. I see what Assyria is doing, but they're only going to be able to go so far, and I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to deliver you, and I'm going to put an end to all this evil, and I'm going to make everything right. And, you know, that's the same message we need to hear tonight. We've talked about all the good things that have happened I hope you've been able to think of many of them in the last year, but there's been a lot of junk. And as we look to the next year, we just know what life's like. There's going to be a lot more junk. And God would say, in general, the same message he gave through Nahum, listen, there's a lot of junk out there. I don't like it either, and I do have a plan. It's all under control. There's only a, there is a limit, and one of these days, my anger is going to go out against all that is evil, against all that is sinful, that is binding my people, and they're going to be delivered. And in the meantime, I'm going to take care of you. And that's where the hope is. I told you the focus was in verse 7 where it says, in the midst of all this mess and all that God's going to do about it someday, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. And this is what we need to cling to. And I know we have been, but as we look forward, we need to cling to this. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. In fact, it's because God is so good that he gets so angry at sin because it destroys us. It's destroying the world. It destroys marriages. It destroys families. It destroys people. But God is angry at sin and evil, and he plans to deal with it. And these are signs of his goodness. And as we look back over the last year, even in the midst of the 
difficulties, if we look, we can find signs of God's goodness. And we can know that as we face the new year, God is going to be good next year. There may be a lot of things we don't like, but God's still going to be good. It goes on to say, the Lord is a stronghold in the day of trouble. A stronghold. Other translations say a strong refuge, a place of protection and safety. And that's mentioned so many times in the Psalms. The Lord is my stronghold. The Lord is my refuge. The Lord is my safe place. Compare that to verse 8 where it says that he is an overwhelming flood to those who choose to defy him. He's an overwhelming, overwhelming flood to sin and evil and those who have given themselves over to it. But to those of us that put our trust in him, he is a stronghold in the day of trouble. I don't know about you, but I've experienced that so many times this last year. In the midst of all the things that were going on, I found my joy, found my hope, found my peace by having faith in the God who is good. And it says that God knows those who take refuge in him. But doesn't God know everybody? Well, he knows everybody. But the way this word is used is talking about he has a relationship with, a special relationship with. He cares for them. He is close to them. He has love and affection to them. He will bless them and take care of those who take refuge in him. And I am so thankful for the opportunity to know God and to know that he knows me. The last thing is, who is it that God knows? It says that God knows in this way. He loves, cares, special place, special relationship, those who take refuge in him. Some translations translate that those who trust in him, and that's what it means. Those who have faith, those who put their trust in God, those who turn to God, not just in the midst of problems because they need his help, which is perfectly fine. But those who turn to God and say, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of good times, God, you are my God. You are my Savior. I'm trusting in you, and I'm going to live for you. I'm taking my refuge in you. And it says that these are the ones that God is taking care of. But we struggle to trust him. The Israelites struggled to trust him, too. Their history is back and forth. They would trust God, and they wouldn't trust God. They would trust God, and they wouldn't trust God. So we struggle sometimes. So the main thing here is this, God's good. God is good. All the time, God is good. All the time, God is good. And he is a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. That should lead to joy. It should give us hope. It should allow us to experience peace. But it requires faith. We need to trust in him. So as we wrap this up, the way we could possibly respond, and I challenge you to be thankful for the past experiences of God's goodness, his blessing, his protection, his patience, his forgiveness, so many things. But if you are in a situation where either you don't have a relationship with God or you do, but you have really struggled trusting him. And because of that, you haven't always experienced the joy and the peace and the hope because your faith has wavered. The challenge tonight is to say, God, help me to truly trust you. No matter what I face, the good times, it's easy, but even in the bad times, help me to truly trust you. And as we face this new year, I challenge you to make a new commitment to walk in faith this next year. Whatever it is that you did experience this last year with joy and peace and hope, it can be a lot better next year as you learn to trust and commit yourself to trust in him. God is good. God was good this last year, and he's going to be good this next year. Are you going to trust him with whatever you face?